So now let's talk about the work stealing aspect of the fork join framework's internals. And this will give you a sense of what it's doing in order to try to maximize CPU core utilization. So the way things work is that the worker threads in the pool, whatever pool we have, only block and thereby put themselves to sleep if there are no other tasks available to run. As long as there's other work, they're going to do work. That's their purpose in life. They don't, they don't feel exploited. They don't feel like they have to take off holidays or weekends. They will just do whatever they need to do whenever there's work to do it. Someone at some point may decide to unionize the threads in the worker pool, but that would be a little silly. Why do they do this? They do this because blocking threads and cores is costly on modern multi-core processors. You do not want things to block if you can possibly avoid it because it takes a lot of cycles to park a thread and then wake it up again. If you want to learn more about kind of why that is the case and how that parking and sleeping and resuming and so on is expensive, take a look at the excellent talk by Doug Lee at this link where he talks about the design of the common fork joint pool and the fork joint pool in general. Therefore, when a worker thread has nothing to do in its deck, rather than put itself to sleep, it first checks to see if there's decks in the worker thread pool that have work to do, and it will find them if it, if it can. If there's anything out there, it'll find it. And we'll talk later about how it finds it. The purpose of this is to allow worker threads with nothing else to do to steal work from the end of busy threads decks. So if there's one worker work, work queue that one thread is dealing with and it's got a bunch of tasks on it and another thread has run out of stuff to do, rather than park itself and go to sleep, it goes and steals something from the tail or the end of the deck. And that again is the Jiffy Lube model of collaborative processing. You pitch in when you don't have anything else to do. The way this works under the hood is it uses randomization. So if a worker thread doesn't have anything in its deck, it rolls the dice, or more generally calls a random number generator, picks a random number within the number of queues that there are, a number of decks. Let's say there's eight cores, so there might be eight decks or whatever. And then it goes and it looks randomly to try to figure out who might have work to do. Why does it do random selection? to lower contention. If it always went and looked at the first one, if everybody all always went and looked at the first element, then you'd have a lot of contention for that particular deck's contents. But by doing this randomly, then it reduces the chance that everybody converges on the same thing as long as the random number generator is reasonably random. Worker threads only steal from threads in their pool. There is no cross pool stealing. We're not gonna have one thread pool, rob Peter to pay Paul. So you only steal from the pool that you happen to be in. That's just the way it works, makes sense. And in fact, the thing to keep in mind here is this is most useful when we're dealing with a common fork joint pool. And if we throw all of our tasks into the common fork joint pool, there is no other pool to steal from. So we're always stealing from decks or queues in our pool, especially the common pool. And that's why I said this, this the fact that you can't steal from other threads in other pools motivates the use of the common fork joint pool because we want to try to have everything in one place so that they can steal and it, it all has global awareness of what is going on. Now here's the important thing. Unlike adding and removing elements on the deck of a worker threads deck, which uses LIFO, last and first out ordering, when you steal threads or tasks, when threads steal tasks, they steal in first in, first out order, or FIFO order. And basically, you push things on the head and then you pull or pull or whatever, you take things off the tail when you're stealing. You're hopefully all familiar with FIFO, that's typically what a queue is like. LIFO is typically what a stack is like. Why do we do this? Because we want to minimize the contention with the worker thread that owns the deck. So contention, of course, can occur. It's the condition that occurs when many threads are trying to access a common resource. Like, here's one of my favorite pictures from a visit I made to India a number of years ago where this is usually what the roads look like. And there's a lot of contention for shared things like roads. So basically what we want to do is minimize the contention so we try to steal from the end. And 
What does that do? That means that we can have a lock at the front and a lock at the back of the queue. And as long as this thread isn't accessing a queue with zero or one elements in it, there won't be any contention on locking for stealing items. So it greatly reduces locking overhead, locking contention. The older stolen task, when done properly with the appropriate divide and conquer like approach that we've been talking about, will typically have things at the end of the queue be the larger units of work just because of the way things work. You typically start with the whole thing, the whole uh, span of data, you put that at the end, well, you actually put it at the front at first, but every time you push something else on, it's typically been subdivided. So the things at the end are usually bigger, which is good because when we steal from the end, we've just stolen something that's big, so when we start splitting that thing up, we've got a lot to work with. So this, the behavior, the fact that older stolen tasks may provide a larger unit of work arises from the divide and conquer nature of how we stuck things into the deck in the first place by splitting them evenly and then doing that until we're down to atomic sized elements that are processed sequentially. So large chunks are pushed onto the deck before smaller chunks. That's just kind of the way it works. Here's, here's a visualization of this. We start out with the whole thing. Then we push some more things on. Notice how when we push them on, the one on the, that was the first one is further back. It doesn't actually, you know, they don't copy data or move it. It's just the way that the deck is implemented internally under the hood. And we just keep doing that until we have atomic sized elements. So as a consequence here, the thread that steals, let's say it's thread T2 is stealing, will always steal the larger subtask from the end of the deck. So it steals it at the end, not the beginning. This allows further recursive decompositions by the thread that stole. So when the thread steals it, it can then chop things up even further and push it onto its deck. And if it can't get to it quick enough, then another thread will come along and steal its stuff from its end. So that's basically how stealing works. So again, larger chunks are pushed onto the deck before smaller chunks, and therefore stealing works in a most optimized way. The last thing I wanna talk about here is how the work queue deck is implemented to minimize locking contention. And you might wanna read this paper that talks about the implementation of a work stealing deck. So push and pop are only ever called by the thread that owns the deck. So push and pop by the thread that owns the deck. We push onto our deck, we pop from our deck. And the way this works under the hood is they use what's called weight free compare and swap operations or CAS operations. And weight free CAS operations are most typically implemented as hardware instructions. They are super lightweight and they work extremely well to guarantee mutual exclusion when there is no or little or no contention because they spin until you get them, compare and swap. So it's like running on a hamster wheel, but you don't have to run very far because you typically get them right away because you're really the main thing that an owner of a thread is really the main one that's pushing and popping onto its own deck. Pull, which is called by another thread to try to steal a subtask, works slightly differently. Uh, again, it's working off of two different locks. There's a lock at the beginning or a, a CAS instruction at the beginning. There's a CAS instruction at the end, but, or a synchronizer at the end. When you call from another thread, that may not always be weight free. And if you want to know the circumstances under which that may not be weight, weight free, take a look at the implementation overview in the fork join pool source code, which you can get here for details on how this implements under the hood. It's quite extensive documentation. Doug Lee, the author, wanted to do us all a favor to explain how his very subtle implementation works. And his very detailed description in the comments section sort of makes up for the fact that there's almost no comments in the code. Um, not the way I would write code, as you can well imagine, but for various reasons, they didn't want to have a lot of comments. So that's the end of the discussion about work stealing and the Java fork join framework internals.